We are finishing our series in Romans with the last chapter of the book, Romans chapter 16. And then next week we'll be beginning our uh, Lenten series in preparation for Easter. So this is uh, Romans chapter 16, beginning from verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sancrie. Then you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Ge- greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trephena and Trephosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus, greet you. Now, to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Calvin. Uh, What a wonderful reading of God's Word. And um, I can confirm that Calvin said all those names absolutely correctly. Um, (laughs) I checked it this week. And if I say it differently, Calvin's right. Okay, so (laughs) I apologize. And so we finally made it. We are at the end of the book of Romans. It took us about nine months, uh, which is not bad. I think I could have doubled it if I... uh, well, even if I tried a little bit, could have extended it a little bit, but, you know, nine months, we're at the end, and I just wanted to run down, you know, as we start here, I wanted to run down through the outline uh, with you once again, uh, just to hopefully help you get it into your long-term memory. Uh, for those that have, you know, seen this a little bit, trying to get this ingrained in you, this is basically my last time uh, being able to ingrain in you the, the outline of the Book of Romans for a while, you know, because, you know, I was telling the other pastors, you know, I've been preaching through Romans, and my goal 
and throughout my ministry is to preach through every single book of the Bible uh, is my goal. And so, and I'm cheating a little bit because like I'm going to count the books that I've already kind of preached on, you know, through these past 10 years. My goal is to preach through every single book of the Bible. So, you know, we're probably not going to get to the book of Romans for another like two or three decades. And so this is my last chance in like 30 years, you know, who knows where you'll be in 30 years. It's ingrained in you, uh, the book the, the outline of the uh, book of Romans, right? So <clears throat> we start, as we look at this outline again, right, it all starts out with uh, the wrath of God, right? The book of Romans, chapters 1 through 3, right, explain to us right off the bat, right, our condition before our Lord, right? It starts off with the wrath of God, and the main idea here is that none are righteous, Paul goes out of the way, especially he's talking to Jews at that time, right, who thought that because they were God's chosen people, right, that they were special in some way. And they were different than the Gentile believers who were coming in. And Paul goes out of his way, just make sure that everyone understands none are righteous. Not a single one of us is righteous as we stand before God, right? But given our condition before God, Paul then spends the majority of this book talking about what then is God going to do, right? What does God do given our condition before him, right? And so through the next you know, six chapters or so, uh, he talks about how we are saved. And the main ideas here is that we are saved by faith through grace, uh, by faith in Christ through grace, right? We're saved. How are we saved? It's by our faith that we are saved. We are made righteous before God, right? And it is in Christ alone, right? Only those who call upon the name of the Lord should be saved, Romans 10, 9, right? And then it's through grace, right? It is through the grace of God that this great salvation has been given to us, right? And so <clears throat> Paul talks about all three out here, right, that we are, this is what our salvation is, this is what the gospel is. And this is really why I wanted to preach through the book of Romans, that each one of us would understand and know what the gospel is, that you are righteous before God right now because of faith in Christ, not because of works, right? Not because you have to try hard in order to, in order to earn your acceptance before God. But the whole Christian life starts with we know who we are in Christ, and we live out our faith in good works because of what Christ has done for us, right? And so, <clears throat> and so we have uh, <clears throat> that section there, and then the next section, right, this is the part I was most nervous about, I think, it was the plan of God, and if you were here, you remember the, you know, how, how it talks about God's plan for Israel, right, and it talks about not just God's plan for spiritual Israel, which all of us are a part of, we're all part of spiritual Israel, right, but, or the church, but then it also talks about the plan for the ethnic people of Israel, the nation state of Israel, right, and that's where you get a lot of opinions and different ideas about what that means there, and so basically God's plan for Israel, both spiritual and physical descendants uh, of Abraham, and finally, in, the, in this last section uh, that we've been talking about is all about the will of God, right? What does it look like to practically live out our faith? And to me, I think the headline of this entire section at the end here was, let your love be genuine, right? Romans 12, 9, right? Let your love be genuine, because if you actually let your love be genuine for one another, right, it's going to cover up a multitude of sins. It's going to um, bring us unity as a church, Right? So many, as we're going to talk about today, right? there's going to be a lot of divisions, there's going to be a lot of different things, uh, we, right? we talk a lot about different convictions that people have in terms of how to live out the Christian life. Right? A lot of people are going to disagree on what Christians should do to honor God or what sh Christians can't do to honor God. Right? We're going to have differences, and Paul's point in this chapter is if you really let your love be genuine for one another. Right, that it is going to keep the church unified, and it's all for the glory of Christ. So, <clears throat> and all of this kind of, kind of really lends to our theme, which is the righteousness of God in you. Right, and, and, and the book of Romans starts off with the righteousness of God. And what we mean by that, you know, is that how, you know, we are sinful and how God is righteous, how God is just. Right, but if, it was, if I only talked about how God is righteous, right, that's really not the gospel. Right, it's not just, Romans is not just about the righteousness of God. Right, but it's about the righteousness of God in you. Right, that right now, you have, just, you have right standing before God. Right now, you are justified. You're in good standing before God. Right, and we never need to question where we stand before God. Right, because Jesus has taken all of our sin so that the righteousness of Christ can be in you, in each one of us. <clears throat> right, and so... Even this last section, right, it's still about the righteousness of God, right? So because we are righteous, right, uh, as we uh, desire to do good works, right, as we desire to live our lives uh, in glorifying God, right, it's the righteousness of God in us that is now working itself out, right, into all of our lives, right? And so 
Right, this is what uh, you know. The Book of Romans is all about, right? This this Rome, this book that you know, without exaggeration, actually has shaped the course of history, right? The, the scholars and people and kings and and theologians have read this chapter and has really shaped, you know, a lot of um, you know, even a lot of history in terms of you know, not just the Reformation, but even just how you know people think about people, right? In terms of seeing people as as people, you know, as created in the image of God. You know, so much of this comes out of the Book of Romans. So. We read chapter 16, you know, I, you know, to be honest, I was a little bit nervous about 16, you know, because I was like, what am I going to do with a bunch of names? <laughs> it's just, you know, a ton of names that Paul writes, and um, I have to say, you know, I probably could have even split this up into two sermons, but, you know, Easter's coming up, and so, you know, I figured we'd just do Easter, and I'll scrunch this down into one sermon, uh, but there's actually so much here, I think, for our consideration, right? And so, let's just walk through the passage, and, and I think you'll see really quickly there's actually more here than what maybe first meets the eye, right? So if we go, uh, just starting at the top, in verse 1, it says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Chaturia, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many, of many and of myself as well. <coughs> so I think it's worth noting right off the bat that... The first person that Paul mentions is, of course, a woman, right? And, you know, I hope that one day um, that I can, in some ways, preach this sermon without having to point out the fact uh, that she's a woman, not because it's irrelevant, but because that we would have developed a culture here that actually really empowers, you know, both men and women in order to do the work of God without uh, that. I wouldn't have to say that, right? But, you know, I should, and I should probably say this up front, that as we go throughout this sermon, I'm going to be like teetering and kind of kind of not beating around the bush but kind of like going around the edges of this whole issue of you know uh, women leadership and the reason why I'm not going into it is not because I don't want to uh, is it's or I mean it would take more than one sermon but also because we just did a Sunday school on it where we kind of work walk through uh, all the different passages regarding this and so you know, if you're interested, I would be more than happy to have an extended conversation with you about that. Uh, but just, I think just in short, if you kind of understand uh, my position as well, the church's uh, and the pastor position, which is, you know, I still believe that the Bible teaches uh, male headship, right? So that's within the church and also, you know, within the home. But I think practical ways in which that kind of lives its, you know, works itself out in the context of a church is mostly in the composition of elders and, you know, aspects of authority and leadership. But that being said, you know, I th I, as we'll see today, I think it's actually very biblical right, to be able to create a culture where both men and women feel empowered to serve and lead, right? And this, you know, is reflected in our church. We've been trying really hard to reflect this in our church, uh, both in our leadership teams, right, even from our church council, you know, all the way on down to ESMT and all the other various ministries. Um, and you really re see, re see that reflected in this chapter as well. All right, and so you have 27 names mentioned right, in this chapter, and nine of them are, are women. Right? And, and really, this is the way it should be, right? Like, as Paul is thinking about the church in Rome, right, and he's thinking about all these brothers and sisters, he's thought, thinking about the ministry of the church, and he starts naming people and trying to encourage them. Right? He starts just naming people, right? And, and as he starts naming people, he has a healthy mix of, you know, as we'll see, not just men and women. And I hope that if anyone was to visit our church and to write a letter to our church, you know, to, uh, you know, rec to commend us or to encourage us, right, that it would also be a healthy mix of men, both men and women. And in one, in one, of, our comment, in one of the commentaries I was reading, right, it says, uh, the guy says, it would be interesting to know what happened in the first hundred years of the life of the church as far as women is concerned. At the time, Paul wrote, they were accepted as fellow workers and given offices in the church. But then within a hundred years, all of that had ceased. There is no further mention of women in leadership positions as far as we know until much, much, much later on. And so this, this is what happens in history, right? As, as you look at history, is we go from what looks like a really healthy mix of both men and women, as we'll see, not just men and women, but socioeconomic and all that. And so it goes from a really healthy mix to basically a couple hundred years later, if you look at the history books, right, it's just all men for like 1,500 years. You know, you see very few uh, women in leadership positions. And in some ways, I feel like 2,000 years later, right, we still haven't fully recovered uh, from that, right? And so I just want to take a little bit of time uh, just to kind of talk about the first two people mentioned here, actually, 
right, who were both women, and kind of the ministry that they had within the context of local church. And hopefully, you know, as, you know, we talked about this on leadership team, as well as, you know, we talked about it in our small group, and I really want to create a healthy environment here where we all men and women, and all poor and rich, all different, it doesn't matter, right, that every single person can feel empowered to serve and to use their gifts and abilities for the sake of the church, right, and so if you look at, so if you look at, you know, Phoebe as an example, right, it says uh, that Phoebe uh, was a patron of many and of myself as well. Now, that word patron uh, in Roman society meant a very specific thing. So if you're a patron, it means that you're probably relatively rich. And what you did is that you would patronize, or not in a bad way, but you would, you would as a patron, you would give money, right, to various people and support them, right? So you would, you know, say, hey, I'm going to support you, and so I become your patron. So, like, if you want to, you know, as an artist, maybe, right, I'm going to be your patron. I'm going to give you money so that you can live, so you can paint me an art piece, or whatever, right? And so a patron was basically someone who supported other people and was relatively wealthy. And so what we see here, you know, is that most likely that Phoebe was a very successful businesswoman, and, and she likely continued her business, as she normally would, but then she supported various missionaries in the early church. And that's probably not too different than many of us, right? We, many of us have full-time jobs that, that we work, but yet we would use some of that money to support you know, missionaries around the world. And that's basically what Paul is saying, right? That she was a patron of many of myself as well. She supported Paul in order to, you know, give him money so that he can do his ministry. And it seems like she was probably already on her way to Rome, right? It seems that Phoebe was already on her way to Rome as she was, uh, maybe had business to do there. And so the reason why, part of the reason why Phoebe's mentioned first is also because uh, she was most likely the person that delivered the, Roman, the letter of the Romans to the Roman church, right? So Paul wrote Romans in, first, uh, in um, Corinth, and Phoebe was also in Corinth, and she was on her way to Rome, and Paul probably said, hey, you're on your way to Rome. Hey, can you take this letter with you uh, and bring it to the church in Rome, right? And so it was very likely that Phoebe was this uh, courier that brought, uh, brought the letter. And so, you know, we, so this is like one, right? And, and as you go throughout, you'll see servants of the Lord or servants is one of the main ways in which Paul labels people or, or commends people, right? In many ways, that's, you know, in many ways, hopefully that's our identity as well, that we can look at one another and say, hey, we are servants in the Lord together, right? And so Paul's commending these people because they are, you know, servants uh, of the Lord, serving together in, in Christ. So that's Phoebe. Uh, the second person right off the bat that we meet uh, that Paul mentions next is Priscilla and Aquila, right? So in verse 3, it says, Greet Priscilla, or Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Now, I actually only really noticed this when I was reading this chapter uh, this past week. And for some reason, you know, Paul refers to her as Prisca, but then in the book of Acts, you know, she's uh, called Priscilla. So the, the book of Acts was written by Luke, and so Luke, for some reason, chooses to use, you know, say Priscilla, and then Paul refers to her as Prisca, and since the book of Acts comes first, you know, in the Bible, I feel like everyone just refers to her as Priscilla and Aquila. Also, that rhymes. I feel like that, that helps, but, you know, so I'm just going to say Priscilla. And so apparently Prisca was the more formal name, uh, and Priscilla was kind of like the nickname or the less formal name. And I have no idea why Luke chooses the informal name, where Paul chooses the formal name. I don't know. But, you know, for now, I'm just going to refer to her as Priscilla, since I think most of us know her uh, by Priscilla. And so, um, and, and so Paul, you know, uh, you know, so either, yeah, either way, it's the same person, right? Priscilla and Aquila were husband and wife. And actually, what's really interesting about Priscilla and Aquila, and we kind of went through this in our women leadership thing, is that when they first meet, right, it's Aquila and Priscilla, right? When Paul first meets them, Aquila and Priscilla, right? Husband, you know, name comes first, and then wife. And then pretty much after that, it's always Priscilla and Aquila, right? Priscilla's name always, almost always, actually always comes first after they first, first meet. And I think a lot, and I think, the reason for that is probably because, you know, Priscilla was much more involved in ministry than perhaps her husband was, right? Now that her husband wasn't there, but it's always mentioned that Priscilla was first, right? And so in many ways, maybe her, her, you know, Priscilla was the one who was a little more active uh, in that. And it's interesting that Paul says that not only I give thanks to them, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well, right? In other words, they were such a prominent couple 
in the early church uh, that actually they, their ministry benefited all of the Gentile churches around them. And just to give you a little insight you know, into what their ministry might have looked like, um, we have this you know, amazing interaction that they had with this guy named Apollos. Um, which is a great name, you know, future present parents out there, I think you should consider the name Apollos. That's a, you know, awesome name. So anyway, so Paul, uh, so in Acts it says, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and talked accurately the things concerning Jesus, although he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Right, so I think the fact that Priscilla is mentioned first indicates that she was probably the one doing more of the talking, right? That she was the one who was like more knowledgeable in the scriptures, more able to explain what the Bible says about Jesus and explained it to Apollos. Right, and to his credit, Apollos then took that knowledge and seemed to have a really powerful ministry later on. And I think just a wonderful example of you know, her using her gifts for the, to benefit the body of Christ. And to, by the way, I would love it if one of you would do that for me you know, as well. Right? If, I would greatly appreciate it if I want to be strengthened and I want to be corrected in my theology. If so, and if anyone wants to... you know you know, make me a little bit more faithful in preaching the Word of God, that would be, you know, greatly appreciated, you know, for me, uh, for me as well. But we see, you know, just her using her gifts for the sake of the body in, you know, and so I don't think, so when it comes to even, when it comes to women teaching, right, it's not that women do not have a teaching role within the church, right? We clearly see Priscilla was very much involved in the teaching and the expounding of Scripture uh, to the people in the early church. And so, you know, it gives you a little bit of sense of, you know, the ministries of Phoebe and both Priscilla and Aquila. And then, you know, after that, we get this really long list of names, right? We get this really long list of names and uh, a little description of what they are commended for. But it's really interesting when we look at this list, right? As I said, there's 27 names mentioned here. Um, and but the interesting thing about the names is that in Romans' time, you can actually know a lot about a person based on the name that they have. All right, so if you, they have like different uh, culture, so it, it, uh, it's easy example is like if someone comes in and they have like a Chinese sounding name, right? Like if you write that, that Chinese sounding name kind of tells you a little bit about you know, where they're from, right? Or maybe sometimes people have an American name and then that tells you a little bit more, right? So, so it's actually, you know, you can tell if someone is Greek or Roman or Jewish just based on their name, right? Because their name, you know, tells them a little bit about their culture. But actually back then, names are also divided by class, right? And so actually the, you know, the royalty or the upper class would choose would choose like certain names for their kids and stuff like that. And then actually the, the lower class, the servants and the slaves would have more names there that are common to them and neither shall the two mix, right? And so they wouldn't name themselves uh, after, you know, the, the, so basically even the naming was kind of based on, uh, based on class. And so you actually know names that are more common to slaves, right? You had no names that are more common to, you know, royalty. And so it's interesting that when you get a glimpse of, you know, so you actually get a real good glimpse of what the early church, church in Rome was like just based on this list of names, right? And it's really this huge melting pot of both men, women, Greek, Jew, slave, free, right? It's different, rich, poor, right? It was this all huge mix of different people within the early church, right? That were all together under the banner of Christ, right? And, and we really see that huge diversity within the church, right? And I think this is why Paul was so concerned about the church remaining unified, Right? Because all those differences, it's so easy for the church to split. It's so easy for the church to everyone just go into their own factions and hang out with people that are similar to you. And Paul spends all this time to make sure that the church would remain unified through their love for one another. And so I just want to give you, you know, a little tour of the names. And so you know, I don't want to spend too much time. But you know, some of these names are kind of interesting. Um, that, uh, and maybe just a little bit, some historical facts about some of the names, just to give you a you know, flavoring. Uh, it's like a little tasting menu of uh, you know, who the uh, Roman church, what the Roman church would have looked like. And so you know, real quick, just kind of uh, some of these names. So for example, in verse 5, you have, greet my fellow uh, Epinetus, who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. You know, I love how Paul remembers his very first 
uh, convert in Asia, right? You can imagine Paul was preaching and sharing the gospel, and probably there was not a lot of people paying attention to him, right? And, and maybe not a lot of people who wanted to believe. And finally, uh, Epinetus, you know, was the first one to come to faith in Asia, right? And Paul remembers him, right? And eventually, I guess, he finds his way to Rome, and Paul kind of remembers him with great, with great fondness, right? Then in verse 8, uh, we have this guy named uh, Amplitas, Amplitas, and uh, now what's interesting is that uh, you know there's you know archaeolog- archaeologists like digging around in you know ancient sites all the time, and there's this really 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 ancient old uh, Christian catacombs in Rome, and so they date the. Christian catacombs all the way back to late first century uh, or the start of the second century, right? So like 100 AD, 80 AD to 120 AD ish, right? Some something around there that they date these catacombs. And what's interesting is that there is a tomb in that catacombs with the name Amplitus, right, on it. So it's kind of interesting, you know, as things are being discovered, that we see some possible connections uh, with what seems like just to be these very mundane details in the Bible, right, you kind of start to see maybe a little bit of connection to uh, to history, right? Uh, We also have uh, Apelles, and it's said that he is approved in Christ. And it's interesting because Apelles is the only person in this entire chapter that's said to be approved in Christ, right? Almost everyone else gets like a worker in the Lord or my kinsman or my fellow worker, right? Apelles gets approved in Christ. And that makes me think, you know, maybe it's a little bit of speculation, but makes me think that maybe Apelles was someone who struggled with insecurity, right? Or maybe Apelles is someone who, I mean, maybe he committed a really big sin and has since repented and is being restored, you know, or, or something like that, right? It seems like something maybe happened in Apelles' life, and I love how Paul uh, remembers him, right? He says, Apelles, you are, remember, you are approved in the Lord, right? You're approved in Christ, right? And really, this is what the gospel is all about, right? This is what Romans is about, right? Whatever we bring to the table, right, it's okay, right? Because through the gospel, through the cross, we are all approved, Right? Not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. Right? And so I love that Paul kind of sneaks that in there. Right? Apelles, who is approved uh, in Christ. Uh, then you have uh, verse 12, and where Paul says, Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. You know, it's thought that Tryphena and Tryphosa are probably sisters. A lot of people also guess that they're twins. I mean, you know, how can they not be twins, right? Their names are Tryphena, Tryphosa. I don't know, maybe they're twins, maybe they're not. Uh, but uh, it does seem really interesting here, and what kind of you know, stuck out to me is that Paul doesn't seem to hesitate to say that some worked for the Lord and some worked hard for the Lord. Right, to me, I feel like I would be a little scared to offend people, right? Like, I'm just like, I commend you and be like, hey, you worked, you know, you're, you worked for the Lord. That's cool. But you worked really hard for the Lord. And so, like, Paul doesn't seem to, like, you know, think that that's a big deal to be able to, you know, include that all in one. And, uh, but I think we all kind of know that it's true in a way, too, right? In, in every church where we do know that there's, there's those who work, we also know that those who, you know, really puts their all in for the Lord. And even just looking at this, you know, little verse here, I think it's a challenge for me, right? What would it be like for me to be, so, to be someone who can be said, right, to have worked hard for the Lord? Right, in many ways, this is not an uh, easy thing for me. I'm uh, naturally a very lazy person, right? It was, it's a challenge for me. What would it look like right, for someone to be able to say, you know, I have used all of my life right, to work for the sake of the Lord? Right, and so, you know, we kind of see that little, little detail uh, here. Uh, then in verse 13, as we continue our little tour, we meet Rufus, um, which... It's probably the second best name in this chapter. I think I like, I don't know, maybe I like Rufus better. And so, you know, someone named your kid Rufus. I, I just like saying Ruf, Rufus. It's just a fun name to say. All right, anyway, so, so we got Rufus. And so, uh, so it says in verse 13, meet, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. And what's super interesting about Rufus is that, um, that this is almost definitely the same Rufus that we find in Mark 15, right? And it says they... Uh, this is Jesus' crucifixion, 
right? So if you remember when Jesus was on his way to the cross, he couldn't carry his own cross, right? Because he was, weak, he was beaten and he was, needed someone to help him. And so they basically just nabbed a random dude in the crowd and said, hey, you, right? It says he was a passerby. He said, hey, you, carry the cross for him. And, uh, and Simon of Cyrene does that, right? So Mark 15, it says, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross, Right? And I think all across the board, it's pretty much uh, thought that the same Rufus that Paul is writing to here in Romans is the Rufus that his dad was the one that helped Jesus carry his cross. And, you know, I just love, and that just amazes me, right? I love how a seemingly random interaction, right, when you're reading it in the Gospels, it's like, hey, you, carry his cross, right? And what seems like just be a random coincidence, right, turns out that that had a huge impact on their family. Right, we don't know what happened to Alexander, but at least for Rufus, right, because his dad helped Jesus carry the cross, right, I think we see him, you know, serving in the church of Rome, right, and it just kind of reminds me of that these little coincidences or it seems like random events are not so random in the Lord, right, and so I think this is a great, you know, amazing completion of the story, right, you just get this random dude carrying Jesus' cross, but then you see the impact that it has on their family. Now, since we're talking about some names, just want to skip down to verse 23. Uh, and so in 23, we have this guy named Erastus, the city treasurer. And what's really interesting about Erastus is that, so they're in the city of Rome, uh, Corinth, right? So Erastus was the city treasurer for the city uh, of, of Corinth, right? So he was in this really, really high uh, governmental position. And in the 1700s, they were doing excavations in the old city of Corinth, and they actually found this huge slab of pavement on the ground that said, basically, Erastus, the city treasurer, paid, paid for this pavement uh, at his own cost or something like that. Like, that was written on uh, the pavement. And, you know, it's just, in, you know, in some ways, it's, it's just, you know, it's cool that, you know, we see uh, the, the various facts that are written in the Bible being confirmed by, you know, archaeology. It's not that we necessarily need archaeology to confirm the, you know, authenticity of the Bible, but we do see as more and more archaeological finds are being, are, be, are being found, right, it starts to affirm many of the little, little, tiny little details uh, that we find in the Bible. And I think, I think the biggest example of this, if I could just offer this real quick, is like uh, the pool of Bethesda. All right, so in the book of John, there's this pool of Bethesda where Jesus healed, right? And, and for centuries, right, people were just like, what is John talking about? There is no such pool of Bethesda. Like, that literally does not exist in Jerusalem. Like, we would have known if there's a, random, if there's a pool there called the Pool of Bethesda. And, Paul, and John actually explains it very clearly. Like, there's five colonnades. And it's like it's a very detailed explanation of the pool. And so basically, in 18, 1888, uh, an archaeologist basically discovered that pool buried under, completely under the surface. So the, the entire pool was, was completely covered up. And so today, you can actually go to Jerusalem, and you can actually see the pool of Bethesda, and it was basically exactly the way that John had described it, right, with the five colonnades around uh, the pool. Right, and so it's, it's in sim and you see this a lot in like scholarship. It's just like, oh, this couldn't have been, right? The Bible couldn't have been written in the first century, or it must have been written hundreds of years later, or this couldn't have happened because he got this historical detail wrong, right? But, you know, it's interesting that, you know, as you see, you know, as you see archaeology and different finds, they continue to uh, substantiate the truth, right, that is found in God's word. All right, so uh, the last name, you know, that I want to mention here is just Ter. Ter Tertius? How do you say it, Calvin? Tertius? Tertius. Oh, is it Tertius? Uh, so Tertius, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, this, this verse might actually surprise some of you if you look at it, because, you know, you might be thinking, hey, wait, didn't Paul write this letter? Like, what, what, what do you mean Tertius wrote this letter? And so basically, Paul did write the letter, but he, more accurately, he dictated the letter, and then Tertius is the guy who wrote it down. All right, so basically, uh, Tertius was Paul's uh, scribe. And so if you, if you really want to impress your friends and you want the really fancy name for this, uh, it's Emanuensis. And so, you know, next time you're in a conversation, just drop Emanuensis. You know, I think people think you're really cool. Uh, but... Don't do that. Probably not. But anyway, so it's, so it's basically it's someone who just dictates letters and stuff for people. It's called an amanuensis, and uh, and basically that's what 
uh, Tertius was uh, for, for Paul, right? And, and it's actually really interesting because in the book of Galatians, uh, he, he, Paul actually says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. All right, so most likely another amanuensis wrote down the book of Galatians and then Paul at the very end was like, hey, listen, I just want to make sure you know that this is me. And he starts writing uh, his, that sentence, right, in his writing and it's like really big and awkward. And this is where we think, this is why we think that Paul had an eyesight issue. Right, that is, maybe he had a um, you know a scribe, not because he couldn't write it down, but because he couldn't see very well, which is why he needed uh, a, an amanuensis to write uh, his letters down uh, for him. Right, and so um, so this gives you m- maybe a little bit of an insight and a glimpse into these various people, right? That was that Paul was writing to, and I think if I could just point out three ways uh, that I think this chapter can have relevance for us today is first. You know, is that when Paul was writing the book of Romans, you know, he wasn't trying to get it published in some big academic paper, you know, or it wasn't only for the cultural elites or for the pastors or the scribes or the scholars. Right? But when you look at this list of people, right, Paul was writing the book of Romans for everyday people. Right? Paul was writing the book of Romans for, uh, for the church. Right? And, and even though there's a lot of you know, theolog- theological things in the book of Romans, I, I think we should never have the attitude right, that we need someone to explain to us what the, what the Bible says, right? that we need you know, someone to explain. Now, commentaries and stuff like that are really, really helpful, right? but I think when Paul was writing, right, he was writing to just the church, so every single person in the church, right, no matter where they came from. I right, said, so this is uh, God's word for you. And in many ways, right, each one of us has the Holy Spirit in us. And we have to entrust that he will apply uh, his word into our hearts. All right, so first, you know, Paul is writing this for everyday people. But secondly, I think, you know, what we see here is that people matter. You know, Paul, you know, had very specific people in mind as he wrote his letter. Right, and as he was writing, he's not just hoping that people would just nod along and people would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's cool. But I, I think Paul's really hoping that lives would be transformed. Right, that the goal of Paul writing this letter with that is, is that it's about people. Right? It's not about programs. It's not about buildings. Right? It, the church is not about anything else, but it's actually about people. Right? And so in many ways, our focus as a church right, is like programs, buildings, all that stuff is important. But it really should be about loving, genuinely loving one another. Right? And the other interesting thing is that the word church is never used in the Bible to refer to as a building. Right, so like, like Sunday morning, if you say, hey, you know, I'm on my way to church. Well, that's true, because once everybody gets here, you're in church, right? But, you know, when I come down on a Tuesday morning, you know, it's just me in this building. I'm not at church in the official biblical sense, right? Because church refers to, always refers to people, right? Never refers to buildings or structures or programs in the Bible, right? And so really, when you think about, um, think about church, it's really all about the people. Right, it's the people that matter. And when Paul is writing this, right, I think, you know, uh, well, yeah. So, third, so first, right, Paul had write this letter for everyday people. Secondly, he, he wrote it because people matter, right? He had these people in mind. But third, what I observe here is that Paul had, you know, a lot of really nice things uh, to say about other Christians. And, you know, it makes me think, like, if we, each, if each, each one of us was to write a letter for our church, Right, like I, 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 it really makes me wonder, you know, well, not makes me wonder, but it's like, it'd be interesting to think, would you have so many nice things to say about the church, right? And it's interesting that Paul had these really high standards, right, of what it means to live out the Christian life. But yet Paul still had so many uh, nice, encouraging things to say about so many people, right? And, and I think, you know, more than anything else in this chapter, I think we see just Paul's love. Right, as, as Paul just names these dear friends, these dear coworkers in the, in the, for the sake of the gospel, right, these new friends that he has because of Christ. Right, I think more than anything else, we just see Paul's love, his love for God, his love for Jesus, his love for the gospel, and his love for the church, and his love for people. Right, and it really stands out to me that, you know, the, really the, Paul's favorite description in this entire chapter right, is that uh, the, his fellow workers in the Lord. Right, for so many people in this chapter, right, he says they are fellow workers in the Lord. Right? And, and so what I think, you know, for, for me here is to see that, you know, it's not just Paul. Right? Sometimes when we read the New Testament, we just think Paul was like this one dude who was going around and doing everything himself. But really, that wasn't the case at all. Right? It was a whole, you know, it was everybody, everybody in the church as workers of the Lord. Right? In many ways, I think that should be the norm. Right? That should be the norm for all of us to see one another. 
right? Instead, sometimes we'll say brothers and sisters in Christ, right? But in many ways, that should be the norm for us to look at one another as fellow workers, as fellow co-workers for the sake of the gospel. Now, you know, very briefly, so that kind of gives you a tour of uh, the different names here. And very briefly, I just want to end by looking at uh, two quick passages uh, before we go to communion, uh, just to kind of wrap up our series uh, in Romans. And so, in, in, and so in verse 17, this is Paul's, like, last, uh, last like, uh, command or last, like, encouragement to the church, right? So he says in verse 17, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Now, so this is basically Paul's last instruction to the Romans, right? I think it's important for us to always, you know, think about what is, what is the thing that someone says last, right? Because whatever he says last, you know, probably is the most important thing that he wants us uh, to remember. And it's, impo- it's interesting that Paul says, watch out for two things, right? Watch out for those that create divisions and watch out for those that are false teachers, right? And I, I really think that those that cause divisions, is a, uh, is a sin, I would say, that we don't often see as very serious. You know, but as, as just like an, as an example, if you look at the track record of just Chinese churches in, I'll only say Chinese churches because I'm familiar with Chinese churches, but if you look at the track record of Chinese churches in kind of this Philadelphia metropolitan area, right, there are, the reason why there are so many churches is not so much because of church plants, although there are some church plants, but the reason why there are so many churches is also because of church splits, right, that ch- two churches are split, and they'll kind of become more churches. You know, sometimes people be like, oh, the Chinese church is great. You know, you guys are always multiplying. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, you know, God, God has his ways, you know, and so, no, that's a good thing. So, so <clears throat> but the, I think that in many ways, like, we don't actually see this as, like, something that's so serious, right? Like, those that cause divisions, like, if you're going to list out sins, right, what are, what are sins you shouldn't do, right? Those that cause divisions is probably not on your top 10 or 20, or you might not even think of it, right, as something so serious, right? But this is one of the things that Paul says, watch out for those that cause divisions, right? And the thing about those that are causing division is that, you know, they never, they never think that they're causing divisions, right? Usually those that are causing divisions, they think they're, they're standing for truth or they're doing the work of God, right? And I'm not saying that there isn't a, a time to stand your ground, but I think the reason why Paul spent all that time about how to love one another Right, even though we have different convictions of how to live a Christian life, is because the unity of the church was so important uh, to them. And so even though I think, you know, as a congregation or as a church, I think we're doing okay uh, right now in terms, of, in terms of this particular area, I think it's still wise to heed Paul's warning right, and to be wary of those that seek to divide us, right, divide our church for unhealthy reasons. Now, the second thing, just real quick, that Paul warns us against is false doctrine, right? And, you know, I think every church needs those who have a rock-solid grasp of the gospel and to be able to teach it faithfully, right? And this is not, of course, just applicable to men, as we saw earlier, right? Priscilla was skilled in teaching Apollos uh, the true faith, right? And I'm not saying that we're not going to have theological differences because we always will, right? But those differences should not be of what the gospel really is, right? The core of the gospel, how we are saved, Right, and our understanding of who God is, these things should remain uh, unchanged. And to be honest, I still think that these are still the two biggest issues for the church as a whole. Right? I, I still think that these two issues are still the biggest issues, that there still continue to be those that teach a different gospel, and there still continue to be those that create division within a church. Right? And even though you know, maybe our congregation is pretty peaceful uh, right now, it seems like to me, I don't know, unless someone else you know, can tell me about stuff, but it seems like we're doing okay. But I think, this is, uh, we, should, I think we always be on guard right, when it comes to these two issues right? and to see those that cause division as, as, something, as, as, as a sin, I think, that should be corrected and not just you know, something that we accept. Now, uh, to close off our time, uh, this is Paul's final, oh, sorry. This is Paul's final benediction. All right, so this is Paul's final benediction to the church in Rome. And he says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now, has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings have been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. 
To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Christ, through Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, this is Paul's final benediction to the, to the church. And he basically says, hey, listen, I want you to be strengthened. Right? I want you to be strengthened. There's three things that are going to strengthen you. Right? The first thing that's going to strengthen you is the gospel. Right? And the gospel should strengthen each one of us because this is our new life in Christ. This is who we are in Christ. The second thing is to be strengthened by the preaching of God's word. Right? This is why I still put a lot of primacy on preaching. Right? This is my one chance each week to be able to disciple the entire congregation all at once. Right? And hopefully through the preaching of God's word that we would be strengthened. And then finally, by prophecy. Right? And I don't have as much time to go into this, but you know, if you think about it, back then, the Bible for the, new, for the church was the Old Testament. Right? There was no such thing as New Testament because it was still being written. Right? And so you know, the Bible for, the old, for that church was the Old Testament. And what happened is prophecy became so important because when you understand who Jesus is, right, you completely read the, uh, the Old Testament differently. Right? It's kind of like those movies where you find out a detail at the end and it makes you want to rewatch the movie and it, and it just com- is completely different the second time around. Right? And so when, you, when, you, when they re- read prophecies like Psalm 22 right, or Isaiah 53 or you read through the book of Daniel and you read that in light of Jesus, right, it completely changes the way that you see uh, the Old Testament. And you know, Colossians, it tells us that these are all shadows of Christ. Right? And once Jesus appears, all of a sudden it starts to make sense. And prophecy can actually be a huge encouragement to our faith. Right? Because prophecy shows us that how God has fulfilled his promises throughout the generations. Right? That the promises that God made thousands of years ago continue to remain true today as we see them being fulfilled uh, in Christ. And so this is how Paul you know, ends uh, his book. Right? And he ends it with, you know, to God be the glory forever. And that should ultimately be the purpose of our lives. Right, to bring God glory. And so we reached the end of the book, this great book of Romans. And as we head into communion, um, I wanted us to take this time just to consider and to remember right, this great gospel on which we stand. Right? All throughout the book of Romans, Paul's been explained to us, this is how we are made righteous in Christ, that the righteousness of God is in us. And I want us just to take some time before we come to communion. Uh, Let us come before Christ and let us realize that we stand firm because of the righteousness of God in you. And so I want to take you, give you guys a little bit of time to come before the Lord. Uh, but before we do, just want to remind you that, you know, here at CCNC, we believe that communion is only for baptized believers. And really, if you look at the communion table, it's a table. Right, because Jesus is inviting each one of us to have fellowship with him. And so if you're a baptized believer when you're ready, just want to invite you to come up and receive the elements, and then we'll take it together. But let's spend some time in the Lord as we remember this great gospel on which we stand.